have to use these quite big dishes and they have to be sort of like isolated in the desert because that's where the, um, the, the radiation is more transparent. So then um, these are um, almantenas in the Chilean desert. Then you have um, infrared and near, um, on far infrared, basically, you have to fly out something like a telescope here. This is a plane, it's called SOFIA. And SOFIA has a little telescope um, that is observing in the infrared. And why do you have to fly it? Because our atmosphere is absorbing all the infrared um, that comes from space. So um, you also have here um, a little um, notation here. So if you are at uh, room temperature, you're emitting at infrared wavelengths. And we know, for example, the sun is much brighter, so its black body spectrum has uh, its peak in, in the visible. And visible light can be um, detected with normal telescopes that, that you know are more, much more common. Um, but when you go to higher energies or um, shorter wavelengths, like these ones, gamma rays, x-rays, and UV, you have to fly out in space because our atmosphere also absorbs those. So this is uh, the SWIFT satellite. It has a number of instruments like the UV optical telescope, the Bursa Lair telescope that it's in observing in gamma rays. Um, and it's basically a spacecraft that is floating around trying to catch those photons. So I'm going to focus on the high energy part, the, the gamma ray um, radiation. How did we discover this? It's very funny because um, in the context of the Cold War, the US um, launched a uh, few spacecraft called, uh, it was a constellation of satellites called the Vela satellites. Uh, they look like this and they were trying to monitor um, gamma ray activity uh, on, on Earth. And they started to find things um, that were not expected and they did not know where they're coming from. Um, so eventually, after a long period of time, a couple of years, they collected a bunch of them and discovered that they were actually not coming from Earth. They were coming from outer space. Um, and they were like, okay, we're not really interested in this, so let the astronomers uh, play with it. So um, a few years after, the BATSE satellite uh, was able to make the first catalog of these um, gamma ray bursts. So depending on their duration, you can see here a histogram, and it basically shows a bimodal distribution. What does it mean? There's a distribution with two peaks. So I'm just showing you basically um, you know, what are the two peaks. You have here one in close to one, uh, 0.3 seconds and then another one, uh, this is a logarithmic scale in um, sort of like 30 seconds. So people at the time were like, okay, if this is true, that means that there are two populations of um, different sources that are creating those GRPs. So um, they were, um, they started studying that um, with more detail and they proposed that binary neutron star mergers were the ones that produce uh, short GRBs. So um, the GRBs that last less than two seconds. So they put here the division in two seconds. And then you have longer GRBs that then were associated with core collapse supernova. So here I have like a little picture. These are binary neutron stars. I'm sure that you already know about these. Um, and this is a picture of a core collapsing supernova. Um, I'm, here putting and showing you um, two light curves of GRB. So what this uh, satellite, what the satellites actually measure is how much photons you get. So, oops, um, you get a count rate, how many, how many uh, electrons are you producing because of the photons you're getting. Um, so for a short GRB, you just have a background, which is this line, and then you have a peak that is less than two seconds. So this is a very bright peak in, in the gamma ray um, uh, wavelength energies. Um, and in comparison to a long GRB, you have here a much longer um, emission of, of whatever object that it was um, collapsing. 
um, there is a concept called the T90, which is the duration, basically. How did they know that, like, how can we compare the duration? So they actually just take um, um, a background level and they calculate um, what is the, the duration of the radiation that is above the background. So basically, it's just only this, this part. Um, then um, just going to dive a little bit in the history of the, the GRVs, what are GRVs and what they thought at the time. It was a very obscure thing because you just have a very, a flash of energy that um, had microsecond variation. So something that is variating very fast. And you also see that it has non-thermal radiation. So it's not something that's just super hot. Um, so how do you explain that? The, um, from the microsecond variation, um, you, can, you can think that whatever is emitting uh, if it's varying in, in on microsecond scale, it has it means that it's very small. So if you have, for example, this black circle, that I'm not saying there's a black hole, it's just like the region that is variating. Um, if the information that comes from from this place um, travel a, a few microseconds, that means that the distance you know that is covering this, it's or the other of the few kilometers. So then you need to, um, since it's traveling that distance already, you know that it's um, not being absorbed within this circle here. So um, there was this problem because uh, radiation, uh, gamma ray radiation um, can produce, uh, can undergo pair production. So you have two gamma rays that when they collide, they can produce an electron and a positron. Um, but how can you overcome that is uh, if you, um, if you beam that um, at a very high um, velocity. So then the frequencies are Doppler shifted um, and then it's not longer um, optically thick. So how do you make this transparent? Well, make it super fast. So then you have here uh, as a conclusion that these GRBs are ultra relativistic. That means that it's going very fast. You have this Lorentz factor that you'll probably keep hearing if you continue in in transient astronomy because there are just things that are exploding and explosions means a lot of velocity, um, something that is very, very rap um, rapid. So then you have the Lorentz factor of, a, of order of 100 so that the Doppler shift can also um, allow it to, to radiate outside of the, of the region that it's emitting. So um, if it's Doppler shifted, then you have um, uh, bluer, uh, more energetic wavelengths, and then these are transparent, and they can get out of the of the region. So, okay, so we know that there is something that is very, very fast, um, very, very fast moving. So, how do you create those things? Um, that's the 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 main question. So what are the progenitors of those gamma ray bursts? So we know what we can characterize what you what we observe but it's harder to infer what it's behind it because um, basically we're, we have a couple of photons and then we're trying to figure out what is happening with those. So um, theoretically, you have, you need two things that, um, you need basically two things to, to happen. You need um, a very compact object that has an accreting disk. So it's either a hyper accreting black hole or a rapid rotating neutron star that generates also um, um, an accreting disk. So then you have um, a number of um, candidates. So you have the neutron-neutron uh, merger, so binary neutron star mergers here. You have the black hole neutron star mergers, black hole white dwarf, dwarf mergers, um, and lately um, the neutron star black hole um, with um, a helium core that merge within a common envelope. So all these um, have been thought to uh, produce short GRVs, um, but then you have a collapsing, um, a collapsing massive star that, have, uh, that can also produce those jets. Uh, and that scenario is called collapsers. But since these are massive, um, the scales are much, lar mar much larger. So that's where um, we think long GRVs come from. 
please note that those GRV photons are produced far from the engine. So if you remember that just little uh, hand wavy calculation we did, if the, um, the radius was, you know, the velocity of the light um, times a few microseconds, that gives you a few um, uh, thousand kilometers, um, which is basically a little bit larger than um, what you would expect, for example, for uh, a neutron star. So neutron star uh, diameter is like about 10 kilometers, and this is three orders of magnitude. Um, so the gamma ray emission does not occur um, from uh, the engine, so it's like in the outskirts of the engine, um, then we cannot observe directly the engine. So you'll probably hear more about um, how can we get more information about the, the actual engine you know, from neutrinos later, and you have already hear, heard about uh, gravitational waves. So this is how we can probe the inner part of this this uh, explosions. So um, as I showed you here, you have multiple kinds of progenitors that can produce a GRV. Um, but once the GRV is produced, once the jet is produced, um, it will interact with the matter that it's outside. We call that circumburst um, um, environment. So that interaction, it's independent of uh, the progenitor. So you have here, uh, the cartoon uh, model of a long GRV produced by a collapsing massive star. So this is the star in the center. You have a black hole, this accreting mass, and it produces a jet that um, breaks the envelope of the star, and then it goes and goes and goes out. out. And then you can see that um, depending on how far it is, how um, fast it is, it will produce um, it will produce radiation that is non-thermal that we call uh, synchrotron radiation. So synchrotron, it's basically um, relativistic cyclotron. So it's it's the interaction of uh, charged particles with um, electromagnetic fields. So um, since these particles are moving very fast, uh, they, when in the, they interact with the, the electromagnetic fields, they produce, um, they produce radi radiation in across the entire spectrum. Um, then you have here, uh, how would it look uh, from, from Earth? So you have here the GRV, independent on what is the progenitor, you have the jet that we call prompt emission. Um, that's the, the actual gamma ray radiation. And then you have um, the afterglow. So this is what happens after you have electrons inter interacting with light, but also electron interactions with themselves and, um, and producing um, self compton scattering um, so you have here a synchrotron um, like, um, sorry, spectrum, and then you have an, an extra uh, contribution from the self synchrotron um, emission. Then um, basically this was to um, tell you that uh, there are a bunch of things happening within this explosion. Um, as you may imagine, this um, material is traveling, um, and since it's traveling, it will encounter this this new matter in the in, in the environment, and then eventually will slow down. And as it slows down, um, the the radiation also changes. So you have what it's called a jet break um, that will occur when um, the um, gamma uh, the sorry the Lorentz factor drops um, uh, northern of magnitude. So basically when the material slows down, um, that produces um, that the, the, the radiation is less beamed. So you have here a very collimated uh, radiation here, um, but when it slows down, it starts uh, to emit in a wider um, area. So then you have uh, less uh, photons. So then it, the, the brightness of this jet of this afterglow will drop. So you have here uh, what we call a jet break. Here are uh, more scientific simulations. Um, this, um, depending on where you are, you will see different things in terms of what if we're looking right through the, the jet, basically what if the observer, um, yeah, the, the viewing angle is zero. So we will see something that is fading very fast 
and then you have the jet break here and it goes down. Um, but what if you're somewhere outside of the jet? So what if you didn't, what if you missed the first part of the afterglow? So you don't really see anything until you start seeing something and then you start seeing something, but you don't really get that much of the energy. So eventually when the jet breaks, you will start decaying. So depending on how far you are from the, the, the center of the jet, you will see different things as well. So again, this is just to show you that um, the phenomena that is happening behind what we see um, can explain what we actually see. Um, I'm gonna take a little detour and um, explain what are long GRVs because it's a little bit relevant to what we've done with, with CTF. So you have here, um, remember that I showed you a, a number of uh, progenitors. I'm just gonna focus on on the one that produces long GRVs. So you have a massive star that in the center, you know, eventually leads to the production of iron. Um, and there's this gravity versus pressure sort of game. And eventually gravity wins, everything collapses. Um, we undergo this super, um, um, this um, wave of nucleosynthesis because the Nucleus, uh, nuclei collapsed, and then you have these shock waves that are going through the material and uh, producing new elements. Um, then this, this material would emit a lot of um, neutrinos because it's changing, it's, um, it's, it's undergoing nucleosynthesis. And these neutrinos help explode the, the star. That's what basically powers the, the supernova. So um, you have this new balance that it's instead of uh, the pressure that comes from um, the, the nucleosynthesis in the, in the nuclei, you have the, the neutrino pressure that is going and exp exploding everything and pushing everything out versus the, 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 the pressure of the, of the material itself. So sometimes um, I have like a little um, a video. So you have the center, you have a massive star, and in the center you have the, the, the collapse. Um, this is the jet that breaks through. It's going very fast um, and eventually will um, collide with uh, the material that is around the star. And that produces um, the, the afterglow that we talked about. So the thing is, depending on where we look at, we'll see different stuff. So if we look directly through the jet, we'll see the gamma ray like that. Um, but if not, we'll be able to see part of the afterglow. So, um, some characteristic of this uh, long GRVs, the, um, if you have um, to, to produce this long GRV, you need uh, gas that is accreted in, in the black hole that is created, right? So the, um, when you have this neutrino um, expansion, if you get rid of everything, you're left with no gas. And that usually happens with um, low mass stars. Low mass stars are uh, easily, um, they, they easily lose all, the, all, the, all their gas. So then there's nothing to accrete and then there's no uh, GRV. So we, first of all, need something that is massive. So the neutrino um, flux that it's going out, uh, it's not able to um, strip, their, um, strip it off from its gas. And then um, you need something that is rotating. So you need a star that's already rotating so that it comes from some angular momentum and you are able to create the accretion disk. So if the supernova fails, so if the supernova does not um, explode and, and, and leave everything behind, meaning that there's some gas still around, and if the core was rotating already, um, you can produce rapid accretion uh, that is fed by, by the, the collapsing star. And then you form a disk and then this disk will form the jet and then you have the long journey. 
So that's the recipe basically. And that is called uh, Collapsar. Um, that's the Collapsar model. Um, it's another little video on um, what is produced after. So you have the black hole engine that is accreting and then you have um, the jet, you have colliding um, material. That, that's what produces the, the afterglow. So that's basically what we um, are looking for. Then um, how do we know this? Um, there's a lot of um, history uh, behind it, but basically the first evidence that we have, it's the, um, the GRB that happened in 1998. Um, so you have the name of the, the GRB is 98 because of the year, 04, the month, and then 25, the, the, um, the day. Um, that day, uh, we observed this GRB. And a few days after, uh, we observed the, the rise of a supernova in, in a galaxy. So you have here a galaxy, and then you have here a supernova. And um, you can monitor the supernova optically. Remember that um, supernova events la last for days, while the GRB just lasts for a few seconds. Um, so it's kind of hard to do the one-to-one the -one, um, correlation. Um, but since we have seen a bunch of them together, it's um, fair to say that they are basically produced by um, collapsing massive stars. There is a special type uh, of supernova associated with long GRB, but um, I just wanted to say that um, there is a supernova connection to long GRBs. Um, then we have um, what we're actually interested in that are short GRB. So here is just a picture of um, a theoretical paper. So theor theorists, what I uh, usually do, uh, they simulate physical conditions. So it also took me a while to understand when I was an undergrad, um, how would this happen? So they just use computers, uh, which is something like, oh, computers, what are they? Um, so you have here two neutron stars. Um, you have here the magnetic fields around. Um, and then when they merge, um, they start mingling their magnetic fields. It's then a mess. So you see here, um, I'm pretty sure that you already talked about Kilonova, but we're going to talk about that too. Um, then you have here the, the, the tidal material that is um, expelled before the merge. And then you have actual the, the actual merger here. Um, and eventually, this will produce um, uh, an extra, a structure in the magnetic field that uh, will allow for jets to happen. So the whole point of this slide is that um, neutron star mergers can produce jets. And when a jet happens, we know that an after rule will come. Um, there are other objects that can produce this sort of jet. So you have two neutron stars here, um, you have a compact binary, mortar, compact binary merger, you have two massive stars. Um, that eventually evolve into either a pair of neutron stars, a neutron star and a black hole, or a pair of black hole. If, uh, if we start with a pair of neutron stars, when they merge, uh, they have two options. They can produce um, a non, um, like a bigger neutron star, um, or they can just collapse into a black hole. In, if, if this collapses into a black hole, you have, um, you have material accreting around the black hole and you produce the jets. Then um, similar situation with a uh, neutron star and black hole. If the neutron star, it's, um, it can also be just um, swallowed by the black hole. But if that doesn't happen, if there's tidal disruption, you'll have an accretion uh, disk. And then you have jets. Uh, and then if you have jets, you have a, uh, an afterglow. Um, then I just wanted to let you know that with those, if we found those um, compact binary mergers, um, honestly, we have been able to um, unambiguous, unambiguously say that this is a binary neutron star merger uh, for 17 out of 17. It's really hard for other sort of um, uh, events to say, yes, this is a binary neutron star merger. But if we uh, were able to say to find more, we could 
uh, study all this basically all these properties. So you have uh, the origin of nu uh, heavy nuclei. You have jet physics. That's because we have jets in the in the in the picture. Um, we can study what remnants um, are left behind. Um, we can study high energy particle acceleration. Um, and basically all the electromagnetic signatures that come with, with this sort of merger. So um, coming back to the picture, you have uh, gamma ray burst. We know that the long GRBs are produced by um, core collapse supernova. We know that um, the jet produces then an afterglow and, um, and a supernova. And we're going to um, describe now what is what happens after the um, um, the neutron stars merge. So you have here a picture in which, um, as you remember, the the two neutron stars were uh, first tidal, tidally disrupted. So you have sort of like a cloud of material that surround the the disk of the of the of the black hole that is um, generating this um, that is. Uh, heavy in, in neutrons, these neutrons will eventually decay um, and they will produce radiation. These neutrons will also um, start uh, bumping into one another um, and that, that will produce uh, heavier nuclei. So we have um, this word called lanthanides. Uh, it's a part of the periodic table that can easily be explained with uh, rapid capture of neutrons. So you need an environment in which you have a lot of neutrons and uh, what better than a neutron star. So in this situation, uh, in this sort of red and blue cloud here is where you are going to produce those elements that are eventually going to decay and produce um, the kilonova um, radiation. And so here you have um, the central engine, you have the jet that we already talked about, you have the afterglow, which is the interaction with the with the um, material around this structure. Uh, we're going to ignore this cocoon, uh, but then we can focus on this uh, kilonova, which is basically the emission that is powered by the radioactive decay of the elements that are created in this in this situation. So you have here um, basically just wanted to show you that um, the the way that we dis that we discover these things um, in the past for example this was the first one um, it's basically um, using observations and saying okay this does not fit what we were expecting so here you have uh, GRB 1306 03b you have here the afterglow um, that is in, in those dashed lines. And then, for example, if you see the, this red line, you have the observation here. And then you have that if this is just an afterglow, it would only just decay. It would decay and decay and decay. But it didn't do that because uh, a million seconds, there was another observation that showed that um, the, um, the source was brighter. So the question is, how can you explain that in such short period of time? So um, that's when you invoke kilonova, because you have here the emission of the of the afterglow that is rapidly decaying. But then on top of that, you can sum the emission of the of this kilonova. So this is the first claim of uh, kilonova detection um, that is based on that one data point. So. Uh, and that was a nature paper. So they just have one data point that um, made it a nature paper. Then um, the entire picture then says, okay, if we are looking into um, compact binary merger, depending on where we look at, we're gonna see different things. If we look through the jet, we're gonna see a GRB. If we are not in the jet, if we're like slightly off, we're not gonna see the jet, but we will see the optical afterglow. It could be also X-ray and 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 in radio because, as I told you before, this um, it's non-thermal emission, so it really it's in, in the entire spectrum. So, um, but even if we're even if not, even if we're farther away, 
we should be able to see uh, the kilonova. So the kilonova is also very fast in, in nature. It's a fast, tra uh, fast fading transient. Um, and I'm sure that Igor told you everything that you need to know about um, them yesterday. So this is the light curve of 1707. You have um, that it's kind of like um, magnitude 17 and in less than two days goes to 19 and a half. So it's a very, fa uh, very fast fading transient. Um, you have here, um, basically now is the motivation for my work, which is trying to look for um, more of these binary neutron star mergers. So what do we do? We know that this, um, this is the LIGO localization map. This is a gravitational wave, um, basically map. Um, and we know that um, from 1707, um, when two stars, two neutron stars merge, they will produce a short gamma ray burst. So here you have the gravitational wave time frequency map. So you see the frequency going up because they're going faster and faster. So the, the frequency goes up and eventually they merge. And then you have two light two GRB light curves. You have the Fermi GBM, the, that's another instrument, and you have um, in, in another spacecraft. And you see that after almost two seconds, um, you detect a short GRB. So what if we go after them without the gravitational wave trigger? What if we just go and look for optical counterparts to short GRBs? And that's what I've been doing. Um, but I have found it very hard because um, as I told you before, there are a lot of things that could also look like um, uh, fast fading transients. For example, the afterglow. So you have here um, long GRBs, you have fast fading things, but how do we know that these are uh, not binary neutron stars? Because they have a, a bump after uh, the tens of days. So this is just to show you the scale. The, the supernova will be visible to us after tens of days, while the, um, the kilonova, um, the kilonovas are visible after a couple of days. So the scales are, are much different. Um, another sort of summary, if you have a long GRV that lasts longer than two seconds, it will produce jets um, and those jets will produce an afterglow and then you should be able to see a supernova and that's what we call cluster. Then if you have a short GRV, you will see it, they will produce a jet, um, they will produce an afterglow, um, but um, the, the optical would also be powered by a kilonova. Um, so um, that's, that's how we know that it's, uh, the, the, the origin is a compact binary merger. So again, you have the fast fading. Um, what if you find something here that is fast fading? What if you say, okay, this is an afterglow. The, the way to, to know whether the origin, the progenitor is a collapsing massive star or a, kil or a compact binary merger is to look for kilonova signatures in the light curve or supernova um, signatures in the light curve. The good thing is that supernova are much brighter than kilonova um, and they also occur after um, in time. So it's, it's um, that's at least a, an advantage that we have in our, in our hand. So how to find them? Um, Shreya talked previously about gravitational waves. Um, Igor probably talked about how you will be able to catch the kilonova um, signature without any sort of trigger, but I'm gonna just focus on the short GRVs. We have been using Fermi. Fermi is a satellite um, that has, well, it's basically this one here. Um, it has two compartments, the one here has one instrument that is very sensitive to high energies, like super high energies. Um, but then we are using the gamma ray burst monitor. It's, it's some, some sort of um, uh, an eye on the sky that's looking everywhere. So it has a wide field of view. It's basically looking everywhere in the sky. Uh, it detects a couple of GRBs per day. Um, it was able to detect 17 and 17, so that's good because we know that it works. Um, and it's more sensitive to higher energies, which is where short GRBs tend to occur. We have this rate of 40 short GRBs 
But the thing is, um, it's really hard to locate them. So these are eyes that are just looking everywhere, but it's very hard to pinpoint where it happened. Um, this is different from other spacecraft. Um, most of the knowledge about short GRBs um, today comes from SWIFT. SWIFT is this other satellite. Um, it is sensitive to lower energies and it's also looking into a 10% of the sky at a time. So uh, as you can imagine, the rate of um, short GRBs is much lower. So we don't have many of them. Um, and it's basically because of the instrument that it's using. So you have here um, the Burst LS telescope. So it's, um, it's a mask of um, just the, those little holes that you see here. They, uh, when there is a incoming light, there's a GRV, they cast a shade. And depending on the, on the shadow pattern, you can reconstruct the direction of it. So that's how this one works. And that's why it's so, um, that's why the, the field of view is so small. While Fermi, the one that we are using, uh, uses those little white things that are basically eyes looking into all directions. So if a photon comes from here, it will go to this one first, and then you can triangulate and say, okay, it, com it comes from this direction. But the problem is that it only tells it sort of like a direction. Here you have a localization map of GBM. Um, it's pretty terrible. You have thousands of square degrees, and we actually looked into it and found things that were rapidly fading. Uh, none of them ended up being the, the short GRB, but whatever. We tried. Um, we're using the, the Swiki Transient Facility to do this. I'm pretty sure that you know about this. Uh, why? Because the localizations are terrible. So you have, um, you need a telescope that can tile the regions very fast. So um, you have here uh, in, in black squares, the CTF regions, and then you have all the stars, uh, all the transits that we, we followed up. Um, how do we do this? After we receive a localization map, like this one, for example, we, um, we tile the regions, um, and then all the transients, all the sources that are changing in flux um, will um, be seen as a potential candidate. But then you will have a tremendous number of candidates. In this case, it's more than 170,000 sources. But we know that only one of them is the, the, the um, afterglow. So we need to run a filtering scheme. So we need that it has to be in the region. Um, it has to be brighter than before. It should be classified as real, shouldn't be close to a star, and it shouldn't be an asteroid. Um, when in this case, in this exercise, um, we went from 175,000 to only 300 sources, which is a little bit more manageable. Um, we can even reduce that farther if we look into the previous history of, of the sources. So you look into the color evolution, the magnitude evolution, you do some cross matches with AGNs because you know that those are uh, variable sources. Um, and you can also calculate distances to potential hosts and, and try to reduce your number of candidates to, to less than hundreds. We usually get um, a, few, a few dozens um, per trigger which is really manageable. You have here, um, how do we do this? Um, we have a portal called Fritz. Um, in Fritz, you can see the cutouts of the, um, of the source. So you have, um, it may be hard to see, but in the center of this image, you have um, a source here that there was not there before. Um, and it has some sort of uh, flags uh, associated with it. And you can access this. Um, through numerous um, ways. Um, you can even download the entire alert, um, alerts discovered uh, per night uh, in this web page. Um, but basically what we're looking, it's for th things that are fast fading. So in this case, we discovered something that was sort of like fading, but then a few days after uh, we discovered that, okay, no, it's not really fading, it's going actually brighter. Another way to, to follow this up is to take a spectrum. So um, we're looking for kilonova signatures in, in the spectrum. We don't like hydrogen. Um, we don't like uh, supernova features. So for example, this one here shows hydrogen. Goodbye, you're a supernova. I don't care. 
Um, we've done this several times. Um, we actually did it six times. Um, we had um, uh, in, in 2018, and then we, we um, came back in, in 2020 because in the mid time you had the Lago Virgo observing run. And we actually discovered something. Um, this is the, um, the GVM localization of a short GRB. It lasted for about a second and, 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 and one second and 14, um, 1. 14 seconds. And then you have here the tiling of our CTF regions. You have the candidates that we had. Um, eventually, other spacecrafts um, were able to triangulate the region to a much smaller um, localization that allowed um, SWIFT to look for X-ray variability. So those circles are XRT pointings. XRT is the X-ray telescope. Um, so you have um, one source here that is this one that it's variating in x-rays, but also uh, it was a transient in CTF. So this one is CTF 20 of whiskey, it was this one here that wasn't there before, and there is a very small galaxy over here, a very faint galaxy over there. Um, when we discovered this, we were super excited because I was like, okay, we finally discovered a short GRB afterglow, um, what do we do now? Um, since we had information about the galaxy, people were able to uh, put this into context with other GRBs. Um, since you know the distance to a GRB, you can uh, look for the energetics of the GRB. Um, and as you may imagine, long uh, the GRBs that come from um, a massive collapsing star have different energetics than the ones that come from um, a binary neutron star merger. So here you have the long GRB population here in, in, in Cyan. And the magenta population is the short GRB. So you see that um, our GRB falls right in the long GRB population. Um, so that means like it could be a, uh, a collapsing massive star. Um, you can do the same exercise uh, using the duration of the GRB instead of just the energetics. And in this case, you also separate here are the long GRBs, here are the um, short GRBs, and it falls sort of like in the middle. The, the probability is not really 100% belonging to this population. Uh, it's sort of like 74, which is basically not decided. So if you have this sort of ambiguity, what is the progenitor type? Because two different analyses say two different things. Um, what did we do? We modeled the afterglow. We look for the galaxies of the um, the host galaxy properties, and then look for um, a supernova and one in a supernova hunt. And actually, well, spoiler alert, we, we have evidence that supports the, the scenario of a collapsing massive star. So I'm just going to start with the afterglow. As I told you before, the afterglow um, comes from the jet, basically, and um, you have two different things. So um, when you have a massive star, it is expected that the density around um, this, this environment is much larger than, um, than for a short GRB. So we can model the afterglow. We have um, parameters like the viewing angle and the energy that was um, uh, input um, into the, into the um, um, circumverse material. You have the density of this material. So if you compare them to the population of, of GRBs found, you have the, the density that we found um, falls right in the middle of the distribution for short GRB densities, uh, but it's really, really um, small for a long GRB. If you look into the energetics that were input by this, this jet, um, you have here that uh, it's much higher than uh, what we would expect for a short GRB, but then it falls right in uh, within a sigma of the population of uh, long GRBs. So from this analysis of the afterglow, it's really hard to say what is the progenitor type. It's uh, basically not conclusive. Um, there are other studies about um, GRBs that have linked um, certain types of galaxies to certain types of GRBs. Um, and in this uh, situation, we took a spectrum of the galaxy. We can get the, the redshift. We can calculate how far from the center of the galaxy was this short GRB. So you have 
um, here, just um, next to my face, I guess, um, <laughs> uh, that the, the long GRVs occur much closer to the center than short GRVs, but this one was right in the middle. Um, usually the galaxies here, the, the plot on the, um, on the bottom right, usually the galaxies are also more massive for short GRVs, but then you have here an overlap. This is the long GRV in gray, and then you have the short GRV in, in, in black, and then exactly where they overlap is where our galaxy falls. So again, from this analysis, uh, it's basically not conclusive. We cannot say it's a collapsing massive star or it's um, a binary neutron, uh, binary, uh, binary compact. Then what can we do? Um, we know that if it's a compact binary, it will produce a kilonova, but if it's a collapsing neutron star, it will produce a supernova. So you have here the light curve. Uh, you have the CTF data points. This is some radio here. This is the X-rays here. Um, we have two more data points here. And we know that this is declining, right? Um, if we uh, see something that goes you know, above and there's like a supernova hump, uh, bump, sorry, um, you would definitely be able to say, okay, this is a compact binary. So what do we do? We took two different images with a very big telescope called the Gemini Observatory. You have here um, uh, the, the science image that we took in September, then a reference image. We subtract those two and the difference shows this residual here. Um, we calculate the magnitude and it's actually above what we would expect. So uh, what would we expect? So you have here the afterglow model. Um, I'm slicing this here. Uh, this is the afterglow model. This is the detection. So you have that the, our models say that this thing, this detection is too bright. When we model the afterglow with a supernova component, this one here in yellow, um, it falls right in the center. So with that, we can say, yes, this is a supernova that makes it the shortest collapser because only in the rest frame lasted for 0.6 seconds. And um, that made it um, the, basically the, the shortest collapser we've ever found. It also supports the um, a scenario here um, in which you have he, um, an entire spectrum of sources that go from a star that collapses and failed to produce GRBs because the material uh, was too thick. So it just didn't, it produced jets, but then they were shocked by the material around. Then you have um, low luminosity GRBs that are supposedly um, GRBs that died, but um, were, uh, did not made it through the surface, but like the shock wave did. Um, and then you have the one that I just presented, uh, a short duration long GRB, which is a GRB that just made it. So you have here the, the, the blue part is the, the, the GRB. Um, and then you have the successful long GRB, which is the one that um, it's powering the, the jet constantly and um, the amount of power that is injected, it's much larger than uh, the one that you need to break through the surface. So you have this game basically of the duration between how much the engine is producing versus how much it will take you to go through the, the material. Um, this work supports basically the, the, the claim that most of these collapsers fail to produce um, jets. Um, I'm just gonna show this one here. Oops. Um, and go and, and, and get some, some questions. So this is what we thought it happened. You have a massive star, it collapsed, it produced the jets and they were going around and then just gonna stop that there. Oh, what did I do? So, um, so if the jet dies here, you would see something like, like this scenario here, but it made it and then it's like, boom, you have a GRV. Um, and then you have the jets and then you have the afterglow and then you have the supernova. But this is what we think um, happened. So um, I'm just gonna stop here and, um, and take uh, questions.
really nice, Tomas. Um, are there questions from the room? Okay, question from the room. I'm not understanding what was that envelope. Yeah. What is this envelope, Tomas? Say it again. I couldn't read here. What What is this? What is the envelope? I guess you can't see my. Oh yeah. So it's the 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 envelope is just the material of the star. This is. Uh, remember that the star has layers, and um, so I'm just gonna start here. So you have this star, um, and I guess the question is, what is this envelope? This envelope is actually the star. This is just happening in the very center of the star where the material is collapsing. Um, and it takes also a moment for the information to propagate. So the outer layers of the star do not really know that this is happening until they are swallowed by, by the, or, or either pushed or uh, swallowed by the, um, the material that is inside. Oops, I hope that helps. Any more questions from the room? Yep. Would you please talk a little bit about like what goes into calculating the breakout? Because I, I guess I'm trying to understand what kind of physical situation would arise to get this kind of seems like a perfect storm almost. Like is the star on the smaller end of the massive star spectrum or well what does it go into calculating uh, T uh, you said breakout. So it it basically is the size of the star. Um but it also depends on um, how bind it is, um, the, also the composition, um, different ele elements have different um, cross sections to um, neutrino uh, radiation and stuff like that. So it also depends on, on the composition, um, the density. Um, so you would expect, um, that a uh, smaller star, when you have this explosion in the center, um, it would be easier to get rid of everything because you have less material. Um, so probably it wouldn't really produce this long GRB because if you um, push everything away, that you have nothing to, um, to accrete. So you have this um, sort of balance because sometimes you don't really have to break out because you have no material to break out. So th they also don't produce a, a, a GRB. Um, but then when you have these more massive stars that um, will produce some accretion, um, you also have this balance between, okay, how much material I am accreting for how long versus what is the, the, uh, the size of the, the outer shell of the star. So this, this distance between the center of the, um, the center of the the black hole and the outer outer part. So it's I I guess this is like a in, in broad in a broad sense is what we're looking for in in time uh, the time that you require to break out. 